Hey everybody, welcome back to the Revelation Bible Study. My name is David Kenny, and I'm the pastor of Walden Community Church here in Montgomery, Texas. We are going through the entire book of Revelation, as seen by the title, right? <laughs> going through the entire book of Revelation, uh, and you're more than welcome to start right here if you'd like. We're going to be in Revelation chapter 11. You're welcome to turn your Bible open and read along with us, or you can go back to the very beginning or find a passage from Revelation that you want more information about. You can probably search in the search field up in YouTube, a specific part or a specific chapter or verse from Revelation, that should bring up the right video for you. We're just starting Revelation chapter one and uh, we'll be right in verse one. First, I wanna ask you, um, I don't know if you've ever started a series of movies uh, where there's, there's many of them, right? Like the Harry Potter films or Star Wars movies or Lord of the Rings, right? And uh, they, they've all been made but you hadn't watched them yet. So you're watching the first one, right? You're watching the first Harry Potter movie, or you're watching the first Star Wars film. You're never worried about the main character, right? You're never worried about the main character because you know the main character lives because you know there's more movies. If you're watching the first Indiana Jones movie, you're not worried. You know there's two more, three more, right? So you're not worried, there's no tension. Revelation's kind of like that. Revelation is the end of the story. You're, you're getting a behind the scenes peek of what takes place at the end of the world. Now, it doesn't mean that you don't worry, but it does mean that you already know. You already know. Revelation says the world is going to get worse. So you know, you know, you don't have to worry. You don't have to worry and say, oh no, the world's getting worse. Every day the world's getting worse. Or to complain about how bad the world is getting. The Bible already told you that it was going to happen. So expect it. We can expect it. You know the Antichrist is coming. You know Satan will try to take hold of the earth. You know that Christians will have it bad. Don't worry. You know the end of the story. You know what's coming. Revelation is preparing you for that. Revelation 11 begins, Then I was giving a measuring rod like a staff, and I was told, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. But do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out. For it is given over to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. All right, so what's going on here? Well, John is taking part in uh, what prophets would, used to do. God would tell prophets to do certain things, and they were actions. The prophets would act out what was coming, okay? And, and so they were like little one-person plays. People would see the prophet doing something, and they would say, hey, what are you doing? And the prophet would say, I'm doing this because God told me. So God is having John mark out the area of judgment that for 42 months, the holy city and the holy temple will be trampled on. So for three and a half years, he says, pagans will take over the temple. That it won't be a place for God any longer. It'll be a place uh, that pagans have taken over. And this is a foreshadowing of the Middle East. Right now, there is not peace in the Middle East, right? There hasn't been for quite some time. And if you were to look at um, what is at the temple right now, it's not the temple, right? What's at the temple right now is a pagan altar. And that's why there's a wailing wall. The Jews go to the wailing wall to cry, to weep, to mourn, to pray for the return of their temple. So can you imagine then that if sometime in the distant future, a person comes along and creates a treaty between the Jews and the Arabs, and both sides agree, and both sides can worship. Can you imagine a peace treaty like that and how the world would respond to this person? This person who is able to bring peace to the Middle East. This is what the Antichrist will do. The Antichrist will bring peace to the Middle East, will draw up a peace treaty between the uh, Jews and the Arabs, but only for three and a half years only for three and a half years, and then after three and a half years, the Antichrist will put his own image in the temple and ask those to worship him. 
That is why uh, John has this measuring staff and he's saying it's, it's for three and a half years and then it's going to be given over to the pagans. Verse 3 says, and I will grant authority. Jesus, God says, then I will grant authority to my two witnesses and they will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. Now, why 1,260 days? It's another three and a half years. It's the same timeline. Okay, It's, it's a seven year period. Okay, Three and a half years, peace in the Middle East. Three and a half years, the Antichrist reigns. These witnesses will be olive trees and two lampstands that stand before the Lord on the earth. So another three and a half years, we have two witnesses from God. They come forth. They are filled with tremendous power. They have this power from the Holy Spirit and no one is able to stand against them. And they are able to even stand up against the Antichrist and speak out against the Antichrist. How, how can they do that? Verse 5, And if anyone would, would harm them, fire pours from their mouths and consumes their foes. If anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. They have the power to shut the sky, that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. So, so nobody can touch them, right? These two speak for God in a world where less and less people are speaking for God, where less people are defending God, where more people are standing on the side of the Antichrist, these two witnesses, these two prophets come forward and they are the opposition to the Antichrist and his power. Now, do we know who these people are? No, we don't know who these people are. They could be anyone. They could be anyone. Uh, theologians believe that perhaps this is Moses and Elijah back from the dead. Yeah, Moses and Elijah back from the dead for real. Because the things that we see them do are the things that we see Moses and Elijah do in the Old Testament. They're doing the same things. The things that are prophesied about them doing are the things that Moses and Elijah did in the Old Testament. So it's, it's good reason to think that this, these are those two back from the dead. Verse 7 says, And when they finish their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. So quite literally, nothing on earth is able to stand against them and that Satan himself has to come and, and kill them. That Satan climbs out of hell to kill them. And then how does the world respond to their deaths? Verse 8, And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, it's Jerusalem, that symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt, where the Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, some of the people and tribes and languages and nations will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents, because these two prophets have been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. This is how the people of the world respond. These two prophets of God, their dead bodies are left in the streets and their pictures and video and image is put on every TV and it's put on the internet, put on YouTube, TikTok for everyone to see. So surprisingly, this all happens during Christmas. So God's prophets are not the only ones who have died, but that means Christmas has died as well, right? Because if this were the time where we would celebrate God's son, now the world celebrates that God's prophets are dead and they go right on with Christmas without batting an eye. It means everything we believe about Christmas or everything we hold true about Christmas is also dead. But here's the thing, you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to fear it. You don't have to dread that day because the Bible already told you it was going to happen. We know it's going to happen. So you don't have to be afraid. Back in 2017, an Irish priest named Reverend Desmond O'Donnell, he said, we've lost Christmas just like we lost Easter and we should abandon the word completely. Just abandon the word Christmas. O'Donnell told the Belfast Telegraph, we need to let it go. It's already been hijacked and we just need to recognize it and accept it. Here's a, here's a priest who back in 2017 wanted to throw in the towel. Just give up. Say, you know what? It's over. Battle's won. Just let it go. And you might look at these passages in Revelation 
and agree. Say, you know what? Let the world win. I don't agree. The Bible never tells us to quit. The Bible never tells us to give up hope. The Bible never tells us to throw in the towel. In fact, it says to do the opposite. James 1.12 says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. You know, the crown of life is given to those where God says, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Servants who've done a good job don't quit. They don't give up. Galatians 6, 9 says, Let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season we will reap if we do not give up. You're not going to find any passages in the Bible about quitting or giving up, even though we know what's going to happen. Even though we know how the world will end up. Even though the world might get worse. Even though Christians will have a hard time. The Bible never tells us to quit. You don't get to quit. We're certainly not going to quit on Christmas. And as Christmas comes back this year, even though we've kind of had a funny year, I would give you that same advice. Don't give up on Christmas. Never give up. This is the day we celebrate hope and peace and all that's good in the world. And as long as there is that spark of hope, as long as there is the promise of the cross, then as Christians, our daily job is to preach the gospel and to let everyone know that Christ is born. I'll see you guys next time. Bye.